By 1915, the Russian avant-garde had pioneered entirely new approaches to art in three dimensions. Today, we have the phrase, think outside the box. They were so far outside the box, they tore up the box, put it in the recycling bin. Tallinn was the first great innovator, using industrial materials suspended at the corner of the wall. The title of this series shows us how innovative his thinking was. It is called a corner counter relief because it is suspended in the corner of the room. Think about it. The corner is formed from the intersection of two planes. It's the angle that marks the third dimension arising from the meeting of two dimensional planes. A counter relief refers to a sculptural process between two and three dimensions where a carving, a casting, or an embossed design is sunk below the main surface area. So Tallinn then is implying that the surface is the space in which we stand and the sculpture is below that, behind that, so that we are part of the push and pull of space in the sculptural experience. But instead of making what is usually called sculpture, marble, bronze, clay, he's constructing. He's constructing industrial materials and he is in doing that pioneering a new way to think as an artist about situating forms in relation to the real world. Another word on the meaning corner. The corner in a traditional Russian home was the spot for the sacred Christian icons. As you see in this painting, this realist painting of a woman praying before the house icons in her home with her sick husband. So this is the spot where Malevich had hung the black square, announcing the negation of this old world of this painting as a representation and its spiritual ideas for an entirely new way of looking and making and of thinking. And so Tatlin is building on that. And Tatlin becomes then the founder of constructivism as a movement in art in which instead of making sculpture, the Russian avant-garde is now constructing industrial materials in space. And this installation photograph from the second constructivist exhibit in 1921 shows us that these are really structures more than sculptures. The word sculpture comes from the verb to sculpt, which implies modeling by hand, shaping clay or chiseling marble in a process of sensitive handling of form. This is much too industrial to be the sensitive handling of materials. These are industrial materials and they are assembled to stand as structures that reach into space. So constructivism goes with ideas of building, planning, and establishing systems. This is why Elzitsky in 1924 creates a photo montage identifying himself as the constructor, because in a sense, the Russian avant-garde is saying we're no longer artists. Not We don't have the purpose and identity that artists once had, which was an idea of expressing an individual personal vision. The constructivists are saying we are closer to being an engineer, a scientist, someone working with logical systems, with impersonal typefaces, someone building knowledge and practical ways to work with modern materials for the modern world. These ide ideas develop as the Russian Revolution moves into civil war and then there is the consolidation of, Bo of Bolshevik power and the defeat of the Mensheviks. The Reds, the Bolsheviks, are victorious over the counter-revolutionary whites, the Mensheviks. And so the civil war was talked about in the language of Reds versus whites and the artists respond to that using the language of suprematism. Here, Elzitsky is talking about the red wedge defeating the white with an image that is a mass produced image because it's actually a print. So it's moved from Malevich's suprematism, which was painting, into the world of typography, graphic design, posters, mass available images, he's still using the language of abstraction 
it is non-objective, but now it's signifying the red is the signifier of the Bolshevik revolution. Notice that the form is pointed, it's sharp, it's forceful, it has a directionality, and it breaks through and penetrates the circle, which seems more inert. The white circle form is more receptive. There's a tension between receptive and active, and there's a sense of these little miniature red wedges being a kind of burst or as there's a shattering and notice that the white shattering is rectangles not wedges so the language of suprematism of constructivism was evolving as the revolutionary experience evolves and elizitsky evolves his language looking back to tatlin's corner counter reliefs to create a spatial dynamic environment, what he called his Pruon space, in which he's using simplicity of materials and forms, plywood, simple flat painted colors, simple geometric shapes, but they are all assembled in a way that activates the corners, that activates the edges, the relationship across the walls, to create a sense that the actual space of the room is now becoming part of the installation that what he's doing is he's not sculpting objects but he's actually activating space and the viewer participates in the three-dimensional complexity turning from side to side looking across relating from wall to wall alongside elizitsky one of the major figures to emerge as a constructivist driving the constructivist movement was alexander rodchenko you see him here standing before a number of his constructions, which are actually collapsible objects. He's wearing the overalls of a mechanic with these deep pockets for tools, because we're to understand that these are not art objects in the way sculptors once made art objects, and he's not an artist in the way artists once acted. He's a constructivist. So he's got been on a journey, which is, a journey of transforming how he thinks about what it means to make art. He had worked around 1915 as a painter, and he was experimenting, like many in the Russian avant-garde, with the potential of cubism to remake space and form. He was committed to the dynamism of modern life, like a futurist. And he creates a painting here titled Dance, which has kind of the pulsing dynamic segments, the pulsing facets and planes that we are familiar with from cubism that add up to a kind of tangle of colored energy. But this is 1915. This is when Malevich makes the black square. And very soon he turns to a radical reduction of paintings elements. He creates three paintings that are completely monochromatic, pure red, pure yellow, Pure Blue, that's their title, 1921. And he states that he has done the ultimate end point of avant-gardeism in painting. I reduced painting to its logical conclusion and exhibited three canvases, red, blue, and yellow. I affirmed, it's all over. So since the Impressionists, painters had been exploring the possibilities of painting as a language, the early 20th century avant-garde had looked into what is the job of painting, how does painting work, and by the time you get Rodchenko, he's saying, he's thinking like a philosopher doing an analytic inquiry into the essential nature of what is painting, and it's just color on a flat surface. In he's, He exhibits these three artworks in an exhibition called five by five equals 25. The exhibition title is a mathematic statement. It's impersonal, just like a monochrome painting is impersonal. There's no hand of the artist to see. And so he's essentially saying, this is the logical end point after Malevich. There's no more painting to be made. This was a, a belief that was very powerful in the 1920s in the constructivist Russian avant-garde. The idea that painting was finished. So where does Rodchenko go next? He had been a student of Tatlin. He was an assistant to Tatlin, worked on the monumental creation that Tatlin had developed, the monument to the Third International, right? The 
monument to the people's revolution. And he starts to use a compass and a, and a ruler to eliminate expressive hand elements. And what he does is he starts to make very curious objects like this one that he calls a spatial construction, which is a kind of network of nesting circles that evokes the planet in orbit because it's a system. They're all repeated circles in a system and it can be shown suspended. So he's clearly learned from Tatli not to limit himself to the pedestal or the wall, but to think about suspension as a way to activate space. And it is actually collapsible. This is very interesting. He's thinking that his object is not gonna have a static form. It's actually going to be mobile. So when we saw him standing before these spatial constructions in his this photograph in his cool mechanic suit, we see them collapsed. He's thinking about objects that are gonna move in and out of the real world and do things. They're not just gonna sit on a wall to be looked at. So certainly one of the best examples is the workers club that he designed, which is a club for workers, a reading space, a media space, a learning space. And it is full of moving and adjustable parts. It's made out of a very accessible and cheap material, wood. And it, the wood is fashioned in very simple planes and geometric forms, circles, triangles, just like all of the constructivist art had been working with. But it's functional. You come in here and you read and the parts are, move, are movable. You could actually lift up this slanted leaf of the table to create a flat surface for more reading. The chess table back here flips up to the vertical to allow people to come in and sit down. What's not visible in this photograph is that there's a, actually a film screen that has a lattice work that pops out to create a lectern for a speaker. This is supposed to be a space where the workers can develop their minds and where they actually can actively alter their environment. They can make it work for them. They are participants in the process. So he's thinking about making things that encourage the workers to be participants in making their own world. This was shown at the Paris Exposition of Decorative Arts in 1925. And take a look at how different it is from what else was on display. The other kinds of examples of the decorative arts, the functional arts, interior design really is what they meant by the decorative arts. These were all examples where innovation was imagined to be very luxurious eye candy, upholstered chairs, crystal chandeliers, everything elegant and evocative of sensual pleasure. In contrast, the Russian Soviet pavilion was about building a new future and that was to be expressed in the actual design. All those diagonals, the wedge form here again, like the red wedge, as if there's a kind of piercing diagonal that's moving toward a new future. Look at how different that is from, this is a postcard showing the pavilion of the Beaumarche, which was a fancy department store in Paris. And it's all, it, it's not modern at all, even though this is supposed to be an exposition of new art design ideas, because it looks like a temple straight out of a king from the ancient Near East. It's all about power and glamour. And this is why the constructivists are thinking in entirely new visual language to actually create not just an interior design, but a world that will encourage people to act differently in this world.